Coming up next on KPBS Evening Edition, the daughter of a San Diego congressman joins a lawsuit to stop the federal crackdown on medical marijuana. Brianna Bilbray speaks out on the issue. And a tiny gnat in the North County is causing problems for an organic farmer and the people who live nearby. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. Hello, thanks for joining us. I'm Joanne Farian. And I'm Dwayne Brown. Occupy San Diego is heading to court. That story in just a moment. But first, pension reform is going to the voters. A measure to reform San Diego's pension system has qualified for the ballot. It took the city clerk's office more than a month to verify enough signatures out of the more than 145,000 that were turned in by reform supporters. The measure is called the Comprehensive Pension Reform Initiative. Some of its provisions, it would give new city employees 401k plans instead of placing them in the pension system. It would also put a five-year freeze on the pay levels used to calculate pension payouts for current employees, and employee unions would not be allowed to block the reforms. Supporters say the measures could save the city $1.2 billion through 2040. Right now, San Diego faces a pension deficit of $2.1 billion. Union leaders say the reform measure puts the deficit solution on the backs of city workers. The face and image of the Occupy San Diego movement is changing. After police recently cracked down and removed tents and people camped out for weeks, now the group plans to ask for a restraining order. They say it's to stop the city and police from suppressing their free speech rights. Demand. We demand the right to have our encampment here so that we can hold these meetings about our government. This is what Occupy San Diego looked like in the Civic Center Plaza about four weeks ago. Hundreds of people camped out, holding impromptu meetings and defiant to move. Here's what the downtown plaza next to City Hall looks like today. Police barricades up, no protesters in sight, besides the people at this news conference who present a stark contrast to their fellow protesters. The banks have ripped us off for years. I, we've all been watching it. We watched the foreclosure crisis. We watched the derivatives crisis. We watched the financial industry meltdown. We've all watched this. It's time to stop being obedient people and start being a little bit disobedient and allow and go up against these big powerful forces. This is the public square. This is public property. It's open to the public. Um, you're all here, we're here now, but what happens is when, uh, when Occupy San Diego tries to bring more people in and, and uh, have their rallies, they're just told by the police, when the police want to enforce the ordinance, that you can't set anything down, you can't put your signs down, you can't set down your bags. This protester says it has nothing to do with getting a permit, but says the group is being unfairly targeted, indirectly pointing to dozens of homeless people camped out nearby. There are homeless all over this, this city who are, are allowed legally to sleep on the streets by a federal court order from 2005 and 2007. It's specifically down here and it is specifically us Occupy SD people who are targeted by the police over and over and over again, even just for smoking a cigarette. Now, organizers say filing legal action against the city and the police is a way to show solidarity with the Occupy Wall Street movement. The owners of two food carts in the Civic Center Plaza say the Occupy protest has forced them to close down. Now they're receiving $4,000 from a fundraiser held downtown last night. The food cart owners say their carts have been damaged and they've been threatened and harassed by protesters. The protesters say the claims are overblown. The city has offered rent credits to at least one food cart owner. San Diego City Council also providing some relief for the owners of family restaurants. Their waiving entertainment fees increased just a few months ago. The fees were imposed on restaurants offering live entertainment. Those who close by 11 at night won't have to pay the fee. The city council has rescinded a state of emergency for the landslide on Mount Soledad four years ago. That slide damaged 82 homes. A state of emergency was declared a few days after the slide, so residents and the city could be eligible for state and federal aid. City, en city engineers now say their repair work is over. San Diego Port Commission is considering a proposal for a veterans park next to the Midway Museum. Museum officials say they want to convert Navy Pier into a double-deck facility. It would include a five-acre park, a permanent venue for community events, and a pair of dramatic sails at the head of the pier.
and a very, very bold idea to create these iconic sail and wing structures that would come to represent San Diego much the same way the arch represents St. Louis and Eiffel Tower Paris. Uh, give, give San Diego a real identity uh, immediately uh, as people come into the bay, land at Lindbergh, or just walk along the Embarcadero. The proposed redevelopment would also include a new park parking lot for the museum. Some opponents of the plan say they are concerned it would block views of the bay. The museum plans to hold three public outreach sessions on the proposal beginning later this month. We've been hearing a lot of debate about medical marijuana lately. Tonight, Joanne has a very personal look at the topic over at the Evening Edition Roundtable. Yesterday, we told you about a lawsuit filed in San Diego and three other cities to stop a Justice Department crackdown on California pot dispensaries. They claim the effort by the state's four U.S. attorneys is unconstitutional, and they're seeking a temporary restraining order halter, halting threatened arrests. The daughter of a San Diego congressman is one of the plaintiffs on the lawsuit. Joining me now is Brianna Bilbray. Brianna has stage three melanoma cancer. Brianna, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. So you began using medical marijuana um, really to fight nausea. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, um, I had to go through chemo and I went through two treatments of chemo and tried the nausea pills that they prescribed to me and they didn't work at all. And then some friends were pushing me to try, you know, other ways to get rid of it and I was prescribed medicinal marijuana and it relieved my nausea right away. So this was how long ago? This was about three months ago. And then you heard obviously like a lot of us that uh, federal attorneys were saying now that they were going to crack down on these dispensaries. What was your first reaction? Well when you go through what I've gone through and experience the benefits of medicinal marijuana it I would I can't bear to think of cancer patients going through this without without the help of medical marijuana or at least it being available for them to try it. So I'm very passionate about it now just because I see how good it works and it should be available and I don't I don't understand why the federal government is cracking down on it right now. So you have joined your name is now as a plaintiff on this lawsuit. Uh, obviously your dad has a high profile in this community. What did you what, what went through your head sort of when you had to make this decision knowing that this would become public, knowing who your dad is? What what were your thoughts on on going public? Well, I realized that um, I would be a target or I would bring more light to the the issue, but I thought that that was probably a benefit. I'm, because of how passionate I am about it now, I, I just thought like I had a duty to actually stand up for what I believe in, not just like sit on the sidelines and see how it ended up playing out. What did your dad say when you told him? Um, my dad just told me to do what I believed in. He's a leader himself and he's not about to tell me to be a follower and follow him, so he, he was supportive. Um, he told me that he was going to stay back, stand back, but um, he's very supportive. and let me do what I believe in. So what are your concerns if the, if the federal uh, government, the federal justice department goes ahead and says okay we're, we are threatening to either civil action or, or even criminal prosecution for dispensaries. We know even at a city level the city of San Diego has also shut several down. What are your concerns? Pretty much I just I can't imagine that happening. I'm wanting this to at least you know, with the lawsuit, what I pretty much want to happen is for them to stop the seizures and let more debate happen or more discussion happen because, like I said, I have, I've realized how beneficial this is to chemo patients and I feel like there needs to be more discussion on the federal level. There should be more funding into the research and because I really can't think that they possibly talk to chemo patients and have the research to back that this doesn't work because it worked for me. I'm a first-hand witness of it. So, And what is your prognosis now? Well, I have a 40% chance of relapse, so I've pretty much come to the conclusion that I should expect to have chemo again. Um, with melanoma, they don't really have a set treatment or know what they're doing in the field, as one of my oncologists told me, so uh, I am expecting it to come back. But right now, hopefully it's passed. But And when you were going through chemo and you were able to get medical marijuana, was it a difficult process or were you able to go to a dispensary with a prescription? Well, oh, well, yes, I, I obviously got a prescription, but um, at first I went to um, another doctor because I was too 
scared, I guess, to talk to my oncologist about it. But after I realized how much it, how well it worked, I approached my oncologist. I had complained to him about the nausea pills not working. The next time I saw him, I told him, "Look, I tried medicinal marijuana and it worked instantly. It went great, like one dose, and I was good for the entire day." And he said, "Well, you know, I I have prescribed that before. I know." my patients have told me. And then in terms of being able to get it, was it tough a couple months ago? It was four months ago? No, it wasn't because um, it was, with this, none of this was going on to my knowledge. So it was, it was a pretty easy process because Good. I had cancer. I had to show the paperwork and all that, but. Brianna Bilbray, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. A tiny bug is in the middle of a big debate in the North County. Here's a look at some of the bugs bugging pets and people, and now they're creating headaches for an organic farm. We'll tell you about it coming up, and we'll show you who's trying to bring back an endangered species of wolf in San Diego's backcountry. This is KPBS Evening Edition. Tonight on KPBS, at 8, the chronological story of one of the most beloved American entertainers of the 20th century, as told by those who knew him best, Jack Benny, comedy in bloom. Then at 9, it's the end of World War II, and decisions will soon be made that will shape Europe for several decades, on D-Day to Berlin. And at 10, go undercover for a close look at revolution in Syria, on Frontline. That's all tonight on KPBS. On Nova, what if the distinction between past, present, and future was just an illusion, or events could unfold in reverse? According to the laws of physics, this can happen. If time isn't what we all think it is, then what is it? Did it have a beginning? Will it have an end? Where did it come from? Physicist Brian Greene reveals a startling new picture of reality, the illusion of time on the fabric of the cosmos. Wednesday at 9 on KPBS. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by Animal rights activists say they don't want to see this at the San Diego County Fair anymore. Today, they went before a state board to ask for a ban on elephant rides at the fair. Members of People for Ethical Treatment of Animals say they are abused by their owners. The company offering the ride says it truly cares about elephants and wants to help preserve the species. Once on the brink of extinction, Mexican gray wolves are staging a comeback. From our healthy San Diego desk, KPBS reporter Susan Murphy and video journalist Katie Ufrat show us how they're reviving the wolf population in San Diego's backcountry. A vibrant chorus cascades down the mountainside near Julian. The talented vocalists are gray wolves. They roam in a 50-acre conservation and research facility known as the California Wolf Center. Aaron Hunt is the center's general manager. Here at the center, we have 23 wolves. Uh, we have six Alaskan gray wolves. And the, the, these Alaskan gray wolves are here for education and research purposes. Uh, we also house uh, Mexican gray wolves, which are critically endangered, with only about 50 living in the wild today. Mexican gray wolves were nearly extinct in the 1970s, with just five remaining in the wild. But the survivors were captured and the species was saved. Today, the Wolf Center is part of a national effort to give them a second chance. We have had uh, one pack of wolves uh, born here actually get to go out into the wild. They lived successfully in the wild for many years. And uh, the alpha female of that pack has offspring that are still currently living in the wild. So she definitely left her imprint on the recovery program. Three more wolves are set to be released this fall or winter to the reintroduction area along the Arizona and New Mexico border. The wolves that are reintroduced have very limited human contact. You don't want to release a wolf that's gotten a little too used to being around people uh, by, by being in the captive environment. So we here at the California Wolf Center work really hard to make sure that our wolves are maintained in as wild a state as possible. 
These Mexican gray wolves thrive here within these fences. Just this past April, four pups were born, but once they're released into the wild, they face many challenges. Once the Mexican gray wolf is uh, released into the wild, that's where uh, a lot of the um, work really begins. Chelsea Davis is the center's animal care and facilities manager. She says the wolves in the wild are monitored and checked weekly. One is we do uh, howl surveys, so they'll go out actually at dawn or dusk around peak activity times for wolves, and they'll actually try and get wolf packs to howl. And you can tell uh, two individuals and two pups. Another way is through special microchipped collars. A lot of times you're expecting that the wolves will stay in the area um, where you release them and then you find out they're 60 miles away from that by the end of the week. The wolves are also observed to make sure they're hunting and eating the right prey, such as elk and fish. That's because the reintroduction area is federal grazing land where roaming cattle and sheep often become tasty temptations. Historically, wolves were killed by ranchers for attacking livestock. At the Wolf Center, they're experimenting with a taste aversion, which is lacing meat with a nausea-inducing chemical. Dan Moriarty, a professor of psychological sciences at the University of San Diego, is using the technique to teach captive Mexican gray wolves that eating sheep will make them sick. Some people have, have described this as a process of going from yum to yuck. You know, it tasted good when you first encountered it, but after this illness episode, it simply doesn't taste good anymore. Moriarty says the question is whether the learned aversion during captivity will be enough to prevent the wolves from attacking livestock in the wild. Certainly it's going to be enough to prevent them from eating, and it's hard to imagine why a predator would attack something, you know, logically, why would it attack something that is, is distasteful? Uh, to it. So the real answer is going to come with the field trials. Moriarty is hopeful the aversion will be an effective tool to boost the number of successful reintroductions. The goal is to create a thriving ecosystem, just like their sister, the Alaskan gray wolf, has done in the northern Rockies. They too were on the brink of extinction and were reintroduced in the wild starting in 1995. So in Yellowstone National Park, when wolves returned, they kept the elk herds on the move and they also were keeping the number of sick, injured and very old and very young animals uh, down to a minimum. So the herds as a whole were healthier and they were moving around more often. This prevented overgrazing, which allowed willow and aspen trees to return and thrive. Uh, with the return of the willow and aspen, we saw a decrease in erosion of the stream beds in the riparian ecosystems or river ecosystems in the park, which meant that songbirds, fish, amphibians, beavers, and all sorts of other life could return to those areas. That's why there's such excitement over four Mexican gray wolf pups born at the center earlier this year. Hunt says they'll likely be selected for breeding or release. Could take several years for anything like that to happen. Uh, like we said, they are very young animals right now, uh, but it is definitely a uh, potential in their future. That story from Susan Murphy and video journalist Katie Euphrat. After six years, conservationists say they're only halfway to their goal of returning 100 Mexican gray wolves to the wild. A tiny bug is causing folks some big headaches in rural areas of San Diego County. Joanne has a look at the issue with her guests over at the Evening Edition Roundtable. Thousands of very small gnats are causing big problems in Hacumba and Escondido. Eye gnats apparently love to breed in the nutrient-rich soil found on organic farms. Farm owners in the vicinity are working with a county entomologist to reduce the problem, but that solution may not be enough for their gnat-infested neighbors. Joining me to explain what's happening is Bill Bramer, owner of BY's Organic Farm, and Cindy Morris. She lives near the farm in the San Pasqual Valley area of Escondido and says the gnats are a nuisance. Bill, let's begin with you. Tell us, first of all, what is an eye gnat? It's a small little insect in the southern part of the United States in warm, sandy ground where they put moisture on the ground is where it's the worst. Now, they don't bite people, do they? They do not bite. They try to get in your eyes, your nose, and kind of get some mucus, the protein from that to go back in legs. And now, Cindy, what are you experiencing with regard to the, the eye gnats in terms of where you live? Um, we have just lost control of the outdoor portion, the portions of our properties. Uh, we don't, we can't have outdoor parties. We can't have grandchildren or children play outdoors easily without 
being infested with these things. Our pets are tremendously bothered. We have uh, at the schools, we have three schools nearby that have been tremendously impacted by the INATs. Uh, golfers. So what happens when you go outside? What do they do to you? They just swarm around and they try to get into your eyes and your nose and your mouth. I've been known to swallow the darn things, you know, if you want to take a walk and, or a hike or something like that. Uh, you have the same problem. You just can't do it comfortably. You know, you should be wearing basically a beekeeper's hat. And so are they coming from your organic farm, Bill? They probably are, some of them are coming from the farm, some of them are coming from the golf course, some of them are coming from the riverbed of the San Pasquale Valley, some of them are coming from the gardens and the landscaping around the houses. So what is it that either Cindy homeowners want uh, Bill's farm to do or officials want your farm to do with regard to the gnats? Well, it depends on whether you're talking about the what is being proposed tomorrow or what was, was on the agenda from last week that now has been pulled. The one from last week was a very severe measure that would have put all organic farmers out of business in the county. The one tomorrow is basically painting us as, as the bad guy, asking for language to make it much more stringent and more, more penal. So in order for you to get rid of the gnats, what would you have to do? Well, that hasn't been discovered yet. The research has just started this year. He's done his first, he finished his work, I think, October 22nd. He hasn't written his report. He hasn't come up with suggestions to us of what's going to happen. Obviously, we're going to be putting traps probably on the farm. We're hoping the neighborhood is going to put traps on the, on the area bordering the egg preserve. And, you know, we might have to modify some of our practice if that's possible, you know, so to control the nets. I mean, if you look at what they did in Hakumba, it was very, very severe. No other farm in the county could have existed under what he has farmed under and so, still stayed in business. So for the people at home, Hakumba has this problem or had They've this had problem? They've had this problem, I guess, since 2003. And what did they do there to address this problem? Well, he had to put a 100-foot strip across his whole property, which I think was like 1,500 feet between him and town, plant it to a, a trap crop, spray pesticides on it every week, mow it to different heights every week. He had to put a, 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 a fence that where the eye nets couldn't fly through. He had to put traps every five feet. He had to take all his land out of production for six weeks in the middle of summer. He had to dry everything down before it was disc. Now, Cindy, first of all, Bill's farm's been there for, since the 70s for a long 95 time? On 95, that 95 on that property. 95 on that property. Your development has been there for a long time. Why now? Why now do you think this is a problem? Uh, I don't know, really. It became uh, sort of a crisis problem probably five or six years ago. Before that, we didn't have any problems with it. I mean, you know, there are normal insects that you see every place, but it was not an infestation. Uh, this seems to have become just in, you know, a problem just in the past few years. And that's why we started forming groups. Uh, you know, originally I saw things in the newspaper about people that were talking to reporters and reporting this, that we were beginning to have a problem. And so we formed a little group to try to uh, figure out some way to alleviate the problem. You know, we thought that maybe by banding together we could uh, bring this to the attention of, of those people that, you know, could possibly help us with it. Perhaps the county. So we know now, we, we know if you used pesticides, obviously you wouldn't be an organic farm. You might get rid Chemical of the gnats, pesticides, correct. but then it, it destroys your business. So ultimately, this goes to the county. What do you both hope um, is the resolution? What do you hope they tell you tomorrow? Well, what they're doing in Coachella Valley that had this problem since 1920, and in Yuma, Arizona, where they've had this problem, I think, since about the 60s, they're doing mass trapping on a countywide scale, and that has controlled the problem and farming is being able to exist and there's quite a few organic farms but this mostly was conventional farming when they started this. Yeah. Our understanding uh, from the scientist that uh, Bill has been working with is that because of our topography and because of our climate, because of soil conditions and everything else, that every situation is different and you can't automatically assume that what has worked in one area is going to work in another. So we have been, our little group has been very happy that he and uh, the entomologist have been working together uh, starting this summer around the 4th of July or so and uh, trying to find some way to alleviate the problem for us so that it's not, you know, so bad. We'll have to leave it there. The we'll definitely be following up with this story. Bill Bramer and Cindy Morris, thank you both for being here. Thank Thanks you so much. Us. 
Would you pay an extra 50 bucks in taxes to preserve teachers' salaries? Your thoughts coming up in a moment. This is KPBS Evening Edition. I'm Ray Suarez. On the next news hour, federal officials cracking down on California's legal medical marijuana industry. That's Tuesday on the PBS News Hour. In the last year, KPBS News has been honored with nearly three dozen awards. I'm extremely proud of these honors, and I thank you for your support as we continue to serve our local communities with award winning news coverage in the years to come. Why the hell should they sleep like babies and I have nightmares? For Holocaust survivors, justice has been difficult to find. Individuals took up the hunt, maybe because governments failed. Whatever has been done, has been done because justice had not been served. Untold stories in the search for elusive justice. Watch Elusive Justice, November 15th at 9 on KPBS. Welcome back to the Public Square on KPBS Evening Edition. Yesterday, San Diego Unified School Trustee Scott Barnett was on the show to talk more about his plan to roll back teacher salaries in an effort to close a huge budget gap. The district is facing up to a $100 million deficit. We asked you whether you'd be willing to pay $50 more a year in taxes to maintain teacher salaries. Well, Craig says our teachers are ridiculously overpaid when compared with teachers in most other states. Our property taxes are already so high that tens of thousands of homeowners in San Diego County cannot afford to pay them and are in default. And Larry, who recently moved from Minnesota to San Diego, wrote in to say it's a question of priorities. He says, I was amazed that one of your guests in response to the San Diego Unified School District budget shortfall suggested that there was no alternative to either slashing teacher salaries or otherwise laying them off. Well, you can weigh in on this or any of the other stories that you saw tonight by following us on Twitter or liking us on Facebook. And of course, you can always email me at jferian at kpbs.org. And now Dwayne has a recap of tonight's top stories. A pension reform measure will go before San Diego voters next year. That measure qualified for the ballot today. Among other things, it would put new city employees into a 401k plan instead of giving them a guaranteed pension. And the Occupy San Diego movement is changing its image a bit and planning to file legal action against the city and the police department. You can watch and comment on any of the stories you saw tonight on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Also want to let you know the Weather Service has issued a high wind advisory that will go into effect early tomorrow morning through Thursday afternoon. Here's a look at the forecast. Have a great night.